Welcome to worship with Kieseltown United Methodist Church and happy Father's Day. We're going to open with a prayer today from Charles Wesley. It, it was a song and even though in this service we have all kinds of places where there's God's word, words of grace, in song, in scripture, in prayer, probably right where you are um, in your sharing, if you're worshiping with other people or if you'll call someone later, the signs of God's grace, God's word for us all around us, sometimes we miss it. This prayer that Charles Wesley has, it reminds us that we need faith to open our eyes, to open our hearts, to receive what God wants to give us. But we also need God's grace. We depend on God enlightening our hearts, giving us understanding. So let, let's pray for that, that we won't miss what God's trying to plant in us today as we go to worship. Let's pray. Whether the word be preached or read, no saving benefit I gain from empty sounds or letters dead, unprofitable all and vain, unless by faith thy word I hear and see its heavenly character, Unmixed with faith, the scripture gives no comfort, life, or light to see, but me in darker darkness leaves, implunged in deeper misery, overwhelmed with nature's sorest ills. The spirit saves, the letter kills. If God enlightened through his word, I shall my kind enlightener bless, but void and naked of my Lord, what are all verbal promises? Nothing to me till faith divine inspire and speak and make them mine. Jesus, the appropriating grace, tis thine on sinners to bestow. Open mine eyes to see thy face, open my heart thyself to know, and then I through thy word obtain sure present and eternal gain. Today I will be reading from Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 through 9, 
and 18 through 23, parable of the sower. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. The Word of God for the people of God. Do we have ears? Listen. Do we have brains for thinking and figuring things out? Let us open up our thinking to Jesus' way of reckoning and figuring things out. A parable, a story about the surprising ways of God with a sower, with seeds, with different types of soil, with a hallelujah harvest, overwhelming, beyond any expectation. Are we listening? Are we hearing? Are we ready to open up our thinking today to what God wants to plant into us and grow in us as God shares his word with us? What's all this parable stuff about? The disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 13. Jesus started this long section on parables that Matthew gives us. Jesus is teaching to large crowds, and the disciples are asking, why are you telling people these surprising, strange stories? It can be a little hard to figure out sometimes. One thing I want to note right here is, it's disciples of Jesus Christ. It's those who follow Jesus who lean in and ask for more information. He says, Jesus, what do you mean? God, what is the Bible talking about? Uh, what's going on in the church? I don't understand. When we lean in to these questions and seek to leave more, it's a sign of discipleship that God can not only plant something in us or expose it to us, but it can grow in our lives as God gives us understanding. Well, with these large crowds, Jesus was telling parables and one of the reasons it seems is there is a whole mix of people out there. Matthew tells us something about this mix and the ways that things are changing at this point in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew chapter 12, we hear that when Jesus is teaching and when he's doing signs, healing people, there are some religious leaders who are not happy about it and we are hearing the opposition to Jesus is rising so high, they're they start to conspire for how to destroy Jesus. In Matthew 14, the, the chapter after this first chapter with a lot of parables in Matthew, we hear the story of how Herod Antipas had John the Baptist executed. And when Herod hears about Jesus, the teaching he's doing, the signs he's doing, he says, here's another John the Baptist, 
And in the reading, we hear that Jesus's might be the next head that's on the chopping block. So the tension is rising. But here, in the middle of this, we hear this surprising story of what Jesus is going to do with the words of God and with the kingdom of God in this parable of the sower, this parable of the different soils. And the sower is very surprising in this story. Um, the sower takes seed, and that's, that's normal enough. But what the sower does is the sower does not target which land, which type of soil will be best. When the sower sign, finds a path where birds or Satan will come along and take it up, the sower begins spreading seed on that path. The sower, when he finds rocky soil, soil that's, that's shallow, where there won't be strong roots, the sower doesn't pass by or ignore it, but begins to sow the seed into that soil. It's interesting, there are early, there are Bible scholars who say, you know who the rocky soil, that shallow soil sounds like? It sounds a lot like those first disciples of Jesus, that when the sun came up, when the persecution rose up, they wilted, they, they fled, they, they hid in the upper room, afraid of the persecution it's a reminder that sometimes the kind of soil we have in our lives can change. And Jesus doesn't wait to sow the goodness of God just when our hearts are perfectly ready. But even when they're not, Jesus is pouring it out. The sower in the story comes to soil that's going to be full of uh, weeds and in thorns and all kinds of things that are going to choke out the life of the seed and the sower doesn't protect it doesn't say well they're too focused on career or making money or school or or cause or self-interest or sin or evil or good things or evil things doesn't say well it'll be wasted there but even where the thorns are the sower is pouring out that seed and then there's good soil. There's lots of room, and the sower in that doesn't pass over the good soil either, but in that place, sows the word of God. This is a strange sower indeed. Three out of the four soils, it's unlikely, improbable, maybe impossible that anything good is going to come out of it it may seem like the seed, which is precious, which has so much potential, which can bring so much growth, so much goodness, why would it be wasted in those places? Well, where it does set in, where it's not only heard and received the good things of God, but where it takes root, where the seed comes out and starts to grow into the, to the seedling, into the young plant, and it grows to maturity because there's room for it, and there's understanding, and there's continuing the light of God being watered, all those things. The harvest of God is unreal. In Palestine, a normal harvest, a good harvest, would be like four times what you planted. A really amazing harvest would be like ten times. But to have a harvest a hundred times or 60 times or 30 times, like Jesus comes from the word when it's planted and it's understood and it grows, it's just a hallelujah, miraculous. It's so much. And it's so amazing to me that God, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and Christians who follow in the ways of God, when we sow, when we share the things of God, we don't just target it for just the places where it will be effective, but in all different kinds of places, all different kinds of people, in season and out of season, when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. We're sharing and sowing the seeds, the word of God, knowing that what God plants can be so 
powerful. And when it does grow, when it does take root, it can bear so abundantly, it's beyond what we hoped for or saw coming. Hallelujah. Are you sowing God's grace and goodness in your family, neighbors, in your work, in the church? Do you ever feel like it's just being wasted? It's not doing anything? The results aren't that great? Many of us have been there or were there right now. If you feel like you're wasting it, do like the sower does. Do like our Lord Jesus does. Do like the saints have done. Keep wasting it. Keep sharing it. Because God keeps giving because of the harvest that is sure to come. What about us in our hearts? What's the soil in our hearts like today? Are we like the path where anything could come and steal away what God wants to plant in us before it even takes root? Are we like the shallow soil where we're excited for a little bit and then trouble comes or it's a little hard and we give up? Are we like the crowded soil where there's so much else going on in our life? God doesn't even really have room. We don't even have time for God to get in there. Or are we starting to, to make room? What's the condition of our hearts? What are the soil conditions? Is there room when God we hear, when Jesus, when the church is pouring out the love and mercy and grace of God all the time, whether we're ready for it or not, expecting it or not, looking for it or not, are we just missing it? Are our ears closed? Is our minds already made up where we don't have room for God's ideas and ways to get in there? I felt like last year in the fall, I hadn't been making enough room. I didn't have enough good soil conditions. One of my favorite spiritual disciplines is reading the Bible. And since I was a child, I've read through the Bible almost every year. And last year, I was reading through the Bible. Our Bishop Sharma Lewis had a great Bible reading plan, and I was doing it. But there's a place I got stuck, and I got behind, and I was struggling a little bit with the different translation in the English that I was using in the Bible last year. And I got to where I was so behind. By fall, I felt so discouraged. I finished the year reading maybe halfway through the Bible, and in that time I heard Bishop N.T. Wright from the Church of England, a, a pastor, a church leader, a Bible scholar. He was talking about the importance of us making room for the Word of God to be in our lives. I was like, I haven't been doing it. And he had a challenge for pastors. He said, pastors, the Word of God is one of the most important things in our lives. We should be reading this through like four times a year. And if you're not reading the whole Bible through four times a year, at least the Gospels. Come on. And I was like, wow. When I made room for one time through in a year to read the Bible, I, like, I thought I was doing pretty good. And here's Bishop N.T. Wright challenging me, saying, what about four times a year? What about making lots of room? for God's grace and word in your life. See what God will plant, what God will grow. And I heard other pastors talking about this, and I was like, I gotta do this. So I made a plan, and I was gonna read through the Bible in 90 days and figured out a way to do it, a gospel chapter each day, some of the Psalms to pray every day, something from the Proverbs, God's wisdom book about every third day, and then just big chunks, big helpings from the Word of God, 10, 11 chapters from other parts of the Bible every day. And hallelujah, that 90-day, three-month reading plan, I finished it in only six months. <laughs> hallelujah. I'm so glad. And you know what? I started it again, and I was coming up on Leviticus, and as I was reading and hearing those words of Leviticus, now I've read through the Bible a lot, but hearing it so recently and with the rest of the scripture I've been reading in that amount, I was hearing things that I just hadn't heard before in those pages. They'd been there all along, but just spending that much time, my understanding was growing what God was doing in that book. 
making ways for anybody to come and know the forgiveness of God, making ways for all the people of Israel, all the foreigners who would be there, and all the who would come into that land where they would have a place, not just to worship, but to flourish in life in God's justice. And it became just a picture. I was like, wow, God, I've seen this in Leviticus before, but it's just hitting me in a different way today. And I was just so thankful. I want to encourage us to make room in our lives to be exposed to what God's doing. Spend time with God intentionally, on purpose, regularly. Make room for what God wants to plant in you and me and to let it grow and give it lots of room to grow. This last week, I was cutting peaches with some of my kids. And I like to cut peaches in a certain way. Uh, so I usually start the stem and I score it halfway around and then I take my hands and I twist it and I open it and when the peach is ripe the way I like it, the peach comes apart, I can pick the stem out and the pit out. I've got all of that peach in those two halves and sometimes I slice it down more and my favorite times I'll put some whipped cream on top of it. Really good. Well, one of my children was there and the peaches weren't very ripe so they were a little hard and asked for help cutting theirs. Uh, so I scored it again in another half, so I had the quarters, and then it twisted. But I still had to cut the pit out. It hung on to one of the quarters, and I did that. The next day, uh, my child was there cutting peaches again. They said, this one's really hard, Dad. I said, well, let me show you what I do. But they had already started to do it. Instead of just scoring it halfway, they had turned it, and they were scoring it again, so it would be in quarters. And I looked, I said, well, that... That's just what I was going to tell you to do. How, how did you know how to do that? Because the day before, they asked for my help. Well, my child told me they were watching me the day before. Fathers, on this Father's Day, when we hear how God plants seeds in us all the time, you know, we are planting seeds in the lives of our children all of the time, even when we're not aware of it, even when we think nobody's paying attention. It's not just in those times where we're being intentional, like, want to plant something on you. No. When we're not even thinking about it. The seeds that we're teaching folks, they're just slipping through our fingers into their, their lives. This makes us always stop and think at this time of year, what are we planting? Because they see the good we do and the bad that we do. What are we teaching and how we do our work and talk about work and how we talk and reflect on news that comes in our community or our nation or our world and how we treat um, our spouse or our friends or our children or our parents how we treat our neighbors and get along, how we worship and engage in our faith, how we help those who are in need. What are the seeds that we're planting? How we use our leisure, how we spend our money. We're planting them all the time. I hope we don't miss out on the things that we really want to plant in our children and the things that God would have us plant, like God will plant in us the good things of God. Now, this sharing seed all, all the time in planting and sowing when we're not even aware, of course, this isn't just restricted to us on Father's or Father's Day. It doesn't matter if we're five or 105. If we're a woman or a man, a boy or a girl, um, a parent who has kids or, or no kids at all, or we're still a kid ourselves, there are people in our lives who we're going to be like parents to, people who look up to us, people who we know a little more. You know, all the time we're planting seeds for how to be. What kind of seeds are we going to plant on purpose? Will we be sowing with God? It's a good word for us when we feel like children to others too. When we're around people or we're less experienced or we don't, we don't know as much or we're new in the church or we're new at work or maybe... We're just children. Maybe we're just still young, living at home. Finding people to be like parents to us who will plant in us the things of God. 
If you don't have those folks yet, and you're like a child someplace looking to learn and grow and be nurtured, don't just find someone with experience. That's good. Find someone there. Seek out people who will share with you and sow into your life and help you make room to grow the things of God. God's love, peace, generosity, kindness. Seek out those folks. One thing uh, I was thinking about this last week and reflecting on is in that crowded soil with the thorns, with the weeds that just choke out everything else. It seems like sometimes my life is so cluttered that there are things I just don't listen to or I just miss, even though God may be speaking it or people around me of faith may be speaking it, that I just completely miss it. I, I don't understand. I can't even hear what they're saying, though they may be speaking all of the time. Um, this week in our nation, there was a big emphasis on Juneteenth, on June 19th, 2020. There are some people in our church who got holidays from work because their, their businesses uh, closed and gave them a holiday to observe and had this whole day uh, to reflect. Some, some people for the first time not having to work on this day and think about what is this time? Uh, uh, what is it? So many times our lives are so cluttered, we're just so busy, we hardly have time to reflect at all. This year I, I took some time, and, and I hope you did too, I think we need these times to unclutter our lives, whether it's Sabbath, or times like Christmas, reflecting on the coming of Christ to set us free, times like Easter, remember Christ's resurrection that sets us free from slavery and death, Thinking about holidays in the Bible, like times to rest and reflect, like Passover. Remember when God delivered the slaves who were in Egypt and set them free so God could be their people and they could be the people of God? We have July 4th coming up. It's a great time to think about what does independence mean? What, did, uh, what was written into our Constitution? Things like the Declaration of Independence and how will we bring some of those things as Christians? Um, for people in our country um, in, the ways, in the ways of God? Well, I had room to think a little bit about Juneteenth this year, and it's a holiday I didn't know much about. I knew it was a, a black celebration um, in our country, but as I learned more about it, you know, it's not just a holiday uh, for black people. It, it's a holiday for us. It, it's not recognized everywhere. It, it's not every in every state, it's not a national holiday, but it's one that celebrates a very Christian idea, and that is the emancipation from slavery, freedom for all people, in this case, in our country, but that idea that God comes to bring us freedom, and that was really powerful to me. I spent time, because I had time, to look back at what did this mean and how did it happen? And I look back and I was surprised at what I found. When Abraham Lincoln passed that, um, declared the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st in 1863, it was an executive order. Um, hadn't been passed by, by Congress or the Senate and it only applied to states in the Confederacy. All slaves would be free in the Confederacy. It did not apply to union states in those union states where slavery was still legal. That Juneteenth, it's the last Confederate state where the Emancipation Proclamation was enacted um, months after the Civil War ended in Galveston, Texas. Um, but that did not bring freedom or from slavery for all slaves in our country. It wasn't until the 13th Amendment passed at the end of 1865 did that happen. On um, that amendment to our Constitution, to, to the fabric for how we were going to weave our nation together, that new amendment, no slavery, no people could be slaves in our country, it couldn't be ratified, an amendment to our Constitution, by just the Union states. They wouldn't have enough votes. You need a supermajority to pass an amendment to the Constitution. Virginia was the first former state from the Confederacy that ratified the 13th Amendment. We're the 12th state to do so. 
the last four states to ratify the 13th Amendment that made it um, ratified for the whole country were all former southern states from the Confederacy. South Carolina, Alabama, North Carolina, and Georgia. That work that many Christians have been doing, many people of faith have been doing, many people in our nation have been doing for so many years, decades and decades and decades. It couldn't be forced through. It couldn't be brought through just by an executive order to be established to make it established, to make it the law for the land, the whole land, it had to become something that we all did together. A, a big majority. We did it together. Those seeds that were planted, they grew and brought quite a harvest. That made me think of some of those folks who spent time planting and sowing. Um, Sojourner Truth. Christian woman, born in slavery. Um, she escaped from slavery with her daughter. She had a son who is still in slavery and she sued for his freedom and was able to get him free from slavery. But Sojourner, Sojourner Truth, she spent her time preaching Jesus, freedom for slaves and freedom for women. Uh, hear what she said. That little man in the back there, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. <laughs> Sojourner Truth. She didn't just seek her own freedom or plant seeds of freedom for her daughter or just for her son. She worked her life preaching and teaching Jesus, freedom for all people, freedom for women, and she lived to see the abolition of slavery in our country. Frederick Douglass, born in slavery in Maryland, he uh, later came out of slavery, and he worked, uh, he preached, he taught, he spoke, he spread seeds for abolition. In people who were excited to hear that news, in places where people were completely hostile to that news. But in those places, he kept sharing it. And one of the things Frederick Douglass said was, when it comes to having the votes for what's right or what's going to happen, Frederick Douglass said, one and God make a majority. Isn't that an interesting thought where we can be so concerned about having a majority and do you have enough people and enough votes? Frederick Douglass said for what's going to happen, for what God's going to make happen, to have the majority for that, it takes God and one person. Frederick Douglass wasn't relying on that. He was sowing those seeds and he sowed them a long time and he lived to see the abolition of slavery. Those seeds he sowed for freedom for them to start to take root and blossom and bring a harvest of freedom. Harriet Tubman, born in slavery in Maryland, she said, I was a conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. She lived not only to see those people she delivered to freedom through the Underground Railroad, she lived to see the abolition of slavery. And even after the abolition of slavery, she continued to plant seeds for God's justice and mercy. I found this prayer that she prayed, and it just touched my heart. The way she was seeking freedom for all people, she prayed, As I lay so sick on my bed, from Christmas till March, I was always praying for poor old master. Peers like I didn't do nothing but pray for old master. O oh Lord, convert old master 
O oh, dear Lord, change that man's heart and make him a Christian. I didn't look up, I don't know much about um, Harriet Tubman's old master or what became um, of him and his family or, or their faith. Didn't have time to look that up this week. But I don't know what the harvest was from that prayer. But what I know was Harriet Tubman was sowing seeds for the kingdom. Like Jesus, our sower, on all kinds of soil. Oh, Jesus, you are sowing your word, sharing your good news, calling us to freedom, forgiveness, righteousness in your word, in people of faith through their word and deeds. Help us to listen. Help us to understand. Bring the harvest of the kingdom of God in us, in our families, in your church, in this world. Not just a small harvest, Jesus. The surprising kingdom, hallelujah, harvest. 160, 30 fold. We're listening. We're beginning to understand. We're sowing. We're looking for the harvest. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's time for us to pray together on this Father's Day. Let's pray for fathers. Let's pray for families. Let's pray to God our Father, who teaches us what real fatherhood should look like, who teaches us as fathers what we're called to be, what we're called to give, who teaches us as children the kinds of things to ask God for, but the godly fathers who are in our life, not just our, 
our birth dads, but all those who have been like, like parents to us, the kinds of things we can ask and hope for and expect in the grace of God. Well, let's pray together. In a day when so many men are absent, we cherish the love of our fathers. Thank God for fathers who comfort and encourage. Thank God for fathers who build character and inspire us to greatness. Thank God for fathers who teach morality and model decency. Thank God for fathers who lovingly convince boys to become men. Thank God for brave fathers who have the courage to resist being absent. Lord, on this Father's Day, may we encourage more men in our community to pick up the mantle of fatherhood. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we commend to your continual care the homes in which we, your people, dwell. Put far from them, we beseech thee, every root of bitterness, the desire for vainglory, and the pride of life. Fill them with faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness. Knit together in constant affection those who in holy marriage have been made one flesh. Turn the hearts of the parents to the children, and the hearts of the children to the parents, and so enkindle fervent charity among us all, that we may evermore be kind and affectionate one to another through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let us pray, as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time to worship God with our tithes and our offerings today. It's also the time that we lift up our prayer partners. Now, if you've been having trouble finding prayer partners, um, I want to give you some today. We have some people who have been part of our church and who have blessed us who are going on to serve new places as pastors starting that first Sunday in July, coming up real soon. And we want to be praying for them too as they're offering themselves again for ministry to plant the word in places, to help people grow in their faith, to lead people in their communities in reaching people for Jesus Christ and bringing the grace and justice of God there. We want to be praying for Jimmy Harris, who grew up in our church. He's going to Weir's Cave United Methodist Church. We want to pray for pastors who've served here. Don Marie Singleton, she's going to go serve at Cherryvale United Methodist Church. Coming out of retirement, we have Reverend David Breeden, and he's going to be serving St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Craigsville. Um, some other folks connected to our church, Joe Amond, he's our former district lay leader, and he's done some great ministry with us. He's going to serve as the pastor of the Shannon Doa Charge. Ed Pruitt, our former district superintendent, who's been a big blessing to us, he's going to serve Mount Pisgah United Methodist Church. And our current director for church vitality, Gordon Merriweather, he's also going to be serving a church in our district, Mount Horeb United Methodist Church. So if you haven't had a prayer partner before or haven't been sure who to pray for, be praying for these pastors and for the congregations they're going to, for what God's going to grow in them. And keep, keep praying for us here at Kieseltown United Methodist Church too. Well, let's have a prayer. Lord, we give you thanks today for all of the gifts that you have given us wondrous God of the universe who finds time to whisper your love to us. We come to your altar with grateful hearts when you speak your love into our quiet moments. It is the most precious gift of all. It is not a gift for us to hold and hide, but to proclaim from the housetops. May the gifts we offer to you today proclaim your love loudly to a world that often feels forgotten. 
Lord, proclaim that word in that news in your grace um, through those friends and pastors and ministers who have blessed our church who are going on to new places, Lord, this year and those churches where they'll be. And Lord, continue to do it in us as we offer our lives and our gifts to you. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. today, let us be those who have received God's good news, but who are ready to share God's news too. And we're going to hear a blessing from Isaiah chapter 55. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, 
but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. 